Welcome, I'm Jennifer Quinton of London Public Library. We acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenapewek, Huron-Wendat, and Neutral Chinantan peoples. The First Nations communities of our local area include Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Muncie Delaware Nation. Poetry London values the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations and all of the original peoples of Turtle Island or North America. We also acknowledge historical and ongoing injustices that Indigenous peoples endure in Canada and the importance of directly addressing these injustices in daily life. Poetry London would like to thank our generous event sponsors, including the London Arts Council, the Ontario Arts Council, the Canada Council for the Arts, Nightwood Editions, Brick Books, and Digibee.net. This month, Poetry London's two feature poets are D.A. Lockhart and Lucas Crawford. They will be introduced by Tom Cull and Madeline Bassnett, respectively. We are also very pleased to welcome our July local opener poet, Dave Montour, who makes some important points about land acknowledgements in his reading. Dave Montour is a retired part-time student who grew up on the Six Nations Reserve. He has participated in poetry readings at Western with former writer-in-residence Margaret Christakos and contributed to recordings of the Indigenous Writers Circle on Radio Western. In 2019, he was a recipient of the Dr. Valio Markinen Undergraduate Student Award of Excellence and a Head and Heart Fellowship. He is a member of the Indigenous Writers Circle an independent Indigenous creative voice at Western. Portrait of 45, top view. A gold-plated toilet seat encircles an orange Dairy Queen blob, speckled with fecal debris, topped off with a bad hair day toupee decaying in a putrid, sulfurous COVID-19 stew. The toilet commode is surrounded by dirty money, further littered with Big Mac wrappers. It is believed his henchman, Stephen Miller, has fled the country. In the university community, during these times, it's become very popular to provide a land acknowledgement, which is basically a statement of fact as to whose lands the universities occupy. Having heard it many times by way of introduction of guests and so on, it's beginning to sound uh, a little old, and thus my poem. The Land Acknowledgement. Good intentions aside, Nations often mispronounced. Foreign and Indigenous students invited into their halls of subtle intellectual and academic racism. A patriarchy. These are the rules of engagement. Marking rubrics for the administrative convenience of tenured procurers, feeding student wood fiber into their colonizing breakdown mills mines baked and kiln dried to be sorted into standardized dimensions degreed and certified with priestly robes to satisfy today's commodities market Hey everyone, my name is Tom Cull and um, today I get the job um, of introducing D.A. Lockhart, Daniel Lockhart, um, and welcoming him to uh, Poetry London. Um, and a big shout out to Poetry London for all the great work they've done um, through uh, this pandemic to keep bringing us um, great voices in Canadian poetry. Um, I'm so thankful for the work um, of the uh, of the steering committee. Um, 
and uh, you know tonight is uh, you know a perfect example of the work uh, that they continue to do. Um, so I came down to the river today to do this introduction because um, because rivers and the lands that they run through figure so highly in Daniel's work and his life. They're a vehicle for connection and confluence. You know, they connect us to one another. They connect us to the places that we live, to our histories. And um, this river that I'm here at, Dashkan Zibi, uh, Antler River, also connects me, us, directly to Daniel. Because if you follow this river downstream, of course, it'll take you through Chippewa, the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames and uh, Muncie, Delaware nations. But if you follow it even further, you'll arrive at um, the Delaware nation of Moravian Town, where uh, Daniel uh, is a Turtle Clan citizen. Uh, Daniel now lives on the banks of another great river, uh, the Detroit River in uh, Wawiatanung, uh, which uh, Wawiatanung is um, Three Fires Confeder Confederacy territory that covers um, both sides of the border at Windsor and Detroit around the river. Um, as Daniel said in a recent um, creative, uh, piece of creative nonfiction in, published in the Malahat, um, the riverbanks of Wawiatanung um, is a place or, where he comes back to again and again. He's drawn back to these places. Um, and on the banks of this river is where his reckonings begin, reckoning with place, history, ecology, language, nation, um, uh, and the ongoing legacy, of course, of colonial violence. As Daniel said in a recent interview in 2019 um, about his book, uh, Devil in the Woods, uh, which was published by Brick, and I've been reading it here this morning by the river, which is so much fun to do. Um, this book came out uh, of a need for him to craft a conversation um, with non-native Canada. A conversation that, in his words, would both heal and ignite. Um, and what a conversation this book is. Um, there's such beautiful irony in the way that Daniel's work is so firmly like rooted in place, um, but the language in it just spins um, uh, so freely and so far-ranging. It's subversive, it's comedic, um, it's uprooting. Um, it's transformative, and um, and I just love I just love it. Um, the book itself is a collection of prayers and letters, um, and they come together, you know, like the forks of a river, to connect head and heart, history and memory, humor and resistance, reckoning and joy. Um, so check out this book, um, but also stay tuned for um, two new books coming out this fall. Uh, Breaking Right, by Porcupine, uh, published by Porcupine's Quill, and that is a book of uh, fiction. And then he, another book of poetry, I think it's his fifth, um, called Two Coney, um, and that's coming out uh, with Black Moss Press. I'm also really excited about a new project that Daniel uh, just told me about that he's working on, which is investigating the rivers of southwestern Ontario through a kind of um, anti-colonial lens and perspective. Um, and so I'm really hoping that I can convince him to uh, jump in a uh, uh, jump in a canoe with me here uh, in Dashkan Zibing, uh, and we can explore uh, this river together and talk more. Um, but in the meantime, I'll just ask that you uh, join me in sending warm thoughts of welcome and gratitude to Daniel for being you know here with us. Uh, today, this evening, whenever this uh, recording um, uh, uh, finds you. Um, so welcome Daniel and uh, warm wishes to everyone. Kulamolsi, from the Southern Three Fires Confederacy Territory at Wawiyongtanong, or as the settlers now refer to it as the border cities of Windsor, Ontario, Canada and Detroit, Michigan, USA. I am D.A. Lockhart, coming to you live from the South Shore, which would be Windsor, Ontario, Canada. 
as you can see from uh, directly behind me, I'm outside of my bunker into my front yard, uh, well, my front porch, and that is definitely a magnolia tree behind me, just bragging how warm and sunny it is down here in Wawi Young and Tanang. For those who don't know me, I am D.A. Lockhart, a uh, poet and writer, uh, Turtle Clan, Lenape, of the Moravian of the Tamas First Nations. Uh, I'm an urban Indian, I've been here for a while. And I am here today to uh, read from a couple of uh, works that came out last year, um, Devil in the Woods, When She Can Have Visions. And I also want to give you um, some sample of new works that are due out this year. I want to, uh, first of all, give a shout out to David Barrick and the fine folks at Poetry London for having invited me to the reading. I really wish I could be joining you in person. I heard lots of great things about uh, the London Public Library, and it would have been wonderful uh, meeting again with the wonderful community members you have up in the beautiful Forest City. Uh, last time I was there, I think I saw some guys like at the London Museum. It was a wonderful time. Anyways, that was for Words Fest. Uh, hopefully, we'll be uh, seeing each other again soon in the near future. So, uh, again, let's get started. You don't want to hear me talk about myself. You want to hear me read poetry. There's so many poets online right now talking about themselves. It's all about the poetry, really. That's what it should always come down to. So, I want to get started with... Um, with Devil in the Woods. This is my book that came out last year with Brick Books. Um, very, very, uh, I'm very, very happy with the way in which they put the book together. A fantastic uh, press based out of London itself. So um, the poems themselves in this collection, are, they're all constructed on Richard Hugo's uh, classic sort of Northwestern American uh, poetry collection, which was uh, 33 Letters and 13 Dreams. This is an homage back to Hugo, who's one of my literary ancestors. Uh, but it's going to tackle contemporary Canadian issues uh, from an Indigenous standpoint. So what these are, this is a collection of letter and prayer poems from a traditional Anishinaabek um, figure. His name is J.W. In the, in the book. To famous Canadians and historical, fictional, uh, contemporary, everything. It's all in there. Uh, and they're a way in which he's engaging with contemporary culture in Canada as an Indigenous person. And there are prayer poems that are used to sort of signify the way in which spirituality has become modernized. We're not the, we're not the little tobacco smudging Indians that you think we still pray when we want to win the 50-50 draw or uh, even pray to start our days. We do the same things that you do. We just do it maybe a little different, right? So I want to start the reading like how I start every day with me, and that's with ritual. Ritual and ceremony is really important in my culture. Um, and for me, it involves prayers, involves singing, smudging in the mornings, uh, giving thanks to Kishalamokwe and uh, sort of all the, the lesser manadus that are around us. So uh, this is going to, this should sound familiar. Uh, it's been out there in the world before, but if you've ever been to a powwow, or you yourself are indigenous and are involved in the culture, you may recognize it. So, this is a ritual prayer. Let us go at this again. The physical preparation for the spiritual's return to the kingdom promised us. As our great-grandfathers fell to pox and our grandmothers to black robe schools. Let us do this again. Steady hands urging the land through muscle memory swung and collided against skin pulled taut like life itself delivered like cattails and wind done again our arms made to tower raised then lowered and the downbeat those stalks rising above culverts and roadside ditches movement is the artifact the soul remembers long past the tales of treated then ransomed lands before the need to tell survivor stories. In unison, the drum haulers of things stolen recreates them. Let us go at this again, the act called a prayer in our own way. Because southern winds have gone this path before and the cries we throw are to a sky still wide open and to the tree line that runs on, itself the horizon of all things worth knowing and the call becomes the prayer and the rhythm of hands, the arenda, so that there might be something of us in the time we have yet to inherit. 
Now, you may remember, uh, we used to do all this thing called traveling and driving. And in Ontario, we have the 401. And that's sort of our main street. And to anyone in Ontario, we all know the OPP. Uh, I usually don't, I'm not as kind when I say the word OPP, I usually spit a little bit. But anyways, uh, some fine officers out there, don't get me wrong. Um, but there are some, there are a lot of bad ones too. So this is that prayer for when you're driving. Um, and you in Ontario, we don't tend to follow the speed limit so well. So we're always on the sort of looking over the shoulder. This is, uh, this is for those moments. This is for all of us who are fearful of the tickets and fearful of much worse. Um, prayer that the OPP officer was opening Timbits. We offer up to you these prayers given at rapidly reducing highway speeds that the uniformed occupants of that median pullout cruiser hath found themselves momentarily lost in wafts of powdered sugar and sparkling glisten awe for leftover donut sweet dough. Let us pray that they slowly caress individual timbits with tender searching fingertips, their gaze fixed upon the future, pleasure of tongue melted sugar. In those moments we pray, may the flashing double digit excess of our highway speed go unnoticed, like all the sufferings of First Nations to uniformed men. Let the sugar promises afforded by sweet dough obfuscate our passing northwards towards home. Yes, many a times. I, I went to school in, uh, uh, at Trent. I was in Peterborough. So the Highway 101 that goes sort of from the 401 up to Peterborough proper, there's lots of great places for the OPP to hide out. I'd never been pulled over. I don't think that's because I didn't necessarily speed i just had a honda civic and i couldn't speed that fast it was an 87 honda civic had the choke i love that car i'm maybe a little strange that way um so we need to do another one let's do um i want to do yes we should be talking about summer so uh for me summer and for many canadians summer is summer camp and while we're all stuck at home we're sort of stuck with the movies and the memories that was summer camp uh, for me, I have this sort of idea the perfect summer camp is in the Halliburton Highlands, so sort of north of where the main speaker of this collection comes from. And uh, there was this wonderful movie, uh, Bill Murray's first movie that I really was aware of, was Meatballs, uh, set in Halliburton area. And uh, Tripper Harrison was his character. I had done a lot of research work up there when I was at Trent, uh, doing work uh, for the Agnes Jameson Gallery, uh, the Andre Lapine collection but doing a lot of work sort of in that area. And I remember coming across the camp that was in the movie, uh, so uh, Camp White Pine. Uh, this is a poem for that, and it's a sort of indigenous reaction to that poem. And, and land that is native land. Not that, not that there isn't land that's native land, but I, I think there's a, a distinct medicine to that space. So this is Letter to Harrison from Camp White Pine at Grass Lake, Ontario. Dear Tripper, we all have to start somewhere, and why not start on a seven degree fall morning and a plywood bunkhouse on the shores of Grass Lake, Ontario? Both glorious and inauspicious in the way that very familiar creatures are birthed to the world. Maybe it's all just a mediocre excuse to justify sleeping in another man's empty bunk after a hard night on the town. The sort of night filled with disappointment from women that only single, straight men in their early middle age would know. The sort of night that leads to lamentations over all those things that you should have done over 40 years ago. Not that I know if you have those regrets, because last time anyone laid eyes on you it was a perpetual summer, and so sunny that regret had no way to weasel its way in. All this is about finding your kingdom in your own time, and presiding over it like a disc jockey at a small town roller rink hoping that no one else recalls that a fall that fall must follow summer and winter after that. It's best not to talk about spring. Rebirths tend to give way to the sort of things that make regret worse. So it's off to greet the sunrise like a bona fide Hironia Anishinaabe, cognizant of treaty rates, only the next time my upper right molar starts hurting, or fishing season opens on Shimong. Because other lies must resemble cult movies understated in their prophecies until we grow up and as certain as you need to be 
to reprove the looming threats of winter and old logging country, I'm going to go and blast Robbie Robertson. Sometimes all regret and lamentation needs is an Indian rock anthem to shake everything free and maybe remind a lake like this one that Camp White Pine belongs as much to us as it did to you. Let those loons guide you home. And, you know, maybe because I'm in the Motor City, and that makes sense. I mean, Windsor is itself a Motor City. We are a suburb of Detroit. While we're young, Tanang is all one city in my book, but that's something completely different. Um, I think about road trips. And we used to do a lot of road trips, obviously, as some of my older books deal a lot with road trips. You can see from a couple of the poems, I like road trips. Um, and I love hip-hop. And there's this idea that I used to drive around a lot, sort of trying to avoid the 401 going up to Peterborough, but this is uh, this is about a lot of that sort of traffic. And what happens when your jam comes on the radio? For me, my jam is my I love Maestro. Uh, I, I love hip hop. I love the Toronto scene. Drake still he's he's my boy. I, I love that stuff. Uh, Dreesus, shout out to indigenous hip hop artists out there. Uh, Natani means all great stuff. But anyways, I want to drop a letter. This is this is about finding your groove, cruising. Find a maestro again. Uh, anyways, let's just go with that. Letter to Williams from the East-West Hydro Line Cut through Markham, Ontario. Dear Maestro, we pulled over in the only clear cut of trees we could find for kilometers in all four directions. Because something technicolor went down with the sun and birch, and neither of us could help but to think about your grand return with Burton Cummings crooning smooth beats and shoulders to hydro tower camera shots you drop it heavy about your homeland we could hear you through the slow rumble of a falling failing header pipe us being given to dance to the things creation bestows upon us kathy and i landed some eagle dance steps before buzzing loose energy before the, the buzzing loose energy from the high tension hydro lines chased us back in back to the highway into her hand me down tempo and back into the motion on blacktop you see it's all about getting elsewhere when you got nothing to your to your credit but hustle some smooth singing and a dance step to rattle love out of even the most confident badger clan woman that is to say as much that we can't all be warriors, no, nor L.A. Sun Kings, because Redbone comes around once every 15 generations, and for us, every road slopes towards Toronto in a way that lets pressure escape failing header pipes and mounting quiet. We are the places that adopt us more than those we sense are owed us. It's not to say we don't struggle with that every day, but understand having a home and proclaiming that love to the world is strong enough to make two high-line drifting Indians pull over for a full solid minutes and shake the earth with their feet in hopes of finding either that which is owed to us or a parcel willing to adopt us like skyscrapers captivated by the way a man sticks to his vision despite seeing a lot of valleys, seeing a lot of peaks, seeing the bitter with the sweet, victory and defeat. No, it's just the way it goes, J.W. All right, we're going to change things up a little bit here. We're going to move into uh, just one single piece from here, and this is when Chikane Visions. This is a collection um, that was put up by Black Moss, the Quiet Collection, that deals with um, framing visions uh, from the Big House, which is our sort of Aslanape. It's our annual um, sort of grand gathering. It's our big spiritual meeting where we all get together and we share visions. I mean, that that's really some that's really sort of summarizing it in a way that I shouldn't. But know that the Big House is important. And when Chikane is a, a reference to the male speaker of visions in the Big House. So this book itself is a performative of what occurred over the previous year of my life before I wrote this book. So I'm going to be reading um, a vision that's set in Toronto in the fall of 2018. It's when I, my book, uh, Gravel Lot, that was Montana, was released with Mansfield. And I was going up to Toronto to do the book launch. And we were actually mourning the loss of Priscilla Upal, who was hands down one of the most important teachers, uh, poets, and editors to come out of Toronto. And we lost her way too young. 
uh, to that uh, that bastard of disease cancer. So um, this has that in the background. I don't know how much it's going to really play into it, but let's just let's go. Let's let's read this and we'll move on to some other stuff. But anyway, this is this is uh, this is the one I dig. I've been missing Toronto a lot. I love Toronto. I love my home, but I also love visiting Toronto. I miss a lot of people up there. And um, yeah, hope to be up there soon. Toronto for the risen. Rust Belt Vision. St. Patrick's Station battered as if a long abused coastal chapel pours us forth into day. In the city of threatening drizzle and overhanging power lines, the gray of a looming first snow moon turns this pigeon cement slab street into a midway amidst the city. People moving as if steelhead heading into the spawn. Hogtown, hear your namesake in the idle chat about Bay Street closeout sales, late assignments, and who has to be where and when. One old house, lost and calling to ground, surrounded in rust, frosted fence, rain drizzle, across coming soon sign. Book launch and wake for the literary guardian angel of this city. Greet the earth with the solemnity of a pilgrimage. Afternoon spent among oil and canvas headstones of a country that must both be recalled and left to haunt the walls of the gallery created in afterthought, bathed in the hopes of everything we dream ourselves to be. Violent jack pines, mangled earth, and dirt-heavy worker tenements, green-gabled farms, the transcendental Arctic and Western mountains. Follow the spawn taken this year-long gomwig for those oblivious to its history. TTC Voice recites Canadian dream poem. Queen's Park, Museum, St. George, Spadina, Bathurst. Please, please exit to the left. Soju Girl smiles back with tenderly caressed leche scented liquor and that innocent airbrush look saying all the things you know you are thinking yet can't admit aloud. Alone, barley tea while waiting, two more customers arrive, pulling in the sounds of blur with them, edge of Koreatown, tastes of bamboo sweetened earth. In the dark, let our way be, back, be lit by backlit quick eats signs. That we shall follow them, drawn in the light beneath the half-built towers, casting the promise of brighter lights. Among the crowd, talk of the raptor's system. Streetcar ciders, sadness through absence. After dark, power lines disappear, and the CN Tower, bathed in Nimer neon, wards off the rain, proclaiming that through it all the city shines on, and all of creation shall look up see it our shirt walked in any other toronto bar is all about smoke the manner aging men find themselves in company share mythologies and draw connections we avoid loss speak of metal bands guitar as salvation and the texture of fermented shark through survival celebrations we encounter time on our terms 1 a.m. Jerk King, every stew the color of bull's blood. Siblings argue over oxtail, point at curried goats and carrots. Alone, subterranean apartment rumbles with the comings and goings of Bathurst Station. Cold rain moved in from the lake, pools under the patio light. Jerk chicken drumsticks, red beans and rice, washed down with YouTube videos, and it all leads back to dreams of Bay Street empty storefronts, violent trees, and the way a single house protected by a rusted out fence holds out against a rising of glass, a rising ocean of glass and steel. Greet the cold of day and the acceptance of wind whipped rain, empty streets, inter-tribal hustle between cover. Toronto the Great, Toronto the Always Growing, Toronto the Apple of Politicians' Eyes. Know your skyline reaches higher each year, grows out in steel and glass, creeping closer and closer to shoreline. Oddest Eds, consumed by condos, and yet both lines of TTC Underground smell sweet 
and stagnant and vaguely of disinfectant. Each step below ground comes closer to certainty that this city rests atop one area code wide unidentifiable woodland mushroom returning dead roots to creation and its union end you shall rise greet the white caps of Nagani Gichigami vault above creation like crow return to earth the same creature that was a that was a fun I miss Toronto. I mean, I, I love Jerk King. And for those who haven't been, go. You have great Caribbean food in London, too. I, I had it there. I had some good red beans and rice back at uh, Words Fest. So, I have a book coming out this this uh, this fall. Another one with Black Moss Press called Tukone, which is more of a homage to Gerald Visner, but also to haiku poets. It's a collection of haiku and haibun set in traditional Lenape times, so 13 moons, and um, sort of exploring this area from the standpoint of the poet. This includes Detroit, which I now miss. It's sort of part of my city I can't go to because the border's closed and because American politicians are morons. Um, but I wanted to sort of at least give an homage back to it. So I'm going to read two haiban, which are a form of prose poem and haiku put together. Uh, taught to me by Terry Ann Carter and Dorothy Mahoney, both amazing uh, haiku haiban poets in their own right. And the section of the collection is famous Detroit musicians and songs, as in famous locally, people that we really embrace as uh Residents of Wawi Nanganang, Detroiters, South Detroiters in the case of Windsor, uh, folks that when we walk the streets of the storied city that we hear, and these are sort of the experiences that come out of that. The first one is for the great Rodriguez, Six Duel Rodriguez. If you don't know about him, please look him up, uh, Saving Candyman or something. Sixto Rodriguez, he was famous everywhere but in Detroit and North America. His music really speaks to the city. He was um, a, Lat uh, a Latino Bob Dylan is the best way to put it. That's probably why he was ignored. He's still alive today. This is stuff was recorded in the 60s and 70s. I'm sure you guys have heard of him. But anyways, um, this first piece is called Near Highland Park, Await the Arrival. Highland Park is a small city within the city boundaries of Detroit. Uh, it's... Uh, gone through some really hard times and the gentrification is not there yet which is good and bad so anyways near highland park await the arrival after sixto rodriguez's song cause from the upcoming collection to Kone. my heart has become a crooked hotel full of rumors of the way one receives love and i need to know how one receives love from the physical places they haunt Woodward Avenue, wider yet than the rivers it was laid down to cover, strikes out poor Galaxy 500 straight to the highlands to the north. From gutter to gutter to strip mall parking lots, I am alone. High, cold sun, bathing uncertain buildings, vacant lots, a vista of the used up, the places our street cart renaissance refuses to enter. Permeates from the earth itself, the exhaustion that comes with refusing to give up, refusing to stop work because of pain. Because there is no Estonian archangel to deliver me from sobriety and emptiness that follows extended work shifts. Across from me, fresh tags mirror, then outshine the nearby church's chicken sign. How many times can you wake up in this comic book and plant flowers? Concrete roadway run through with tar patch veins. Hard seams cradle shadow. Too tired to stand. There's this band uh, named Robert Bradley. Uh, Robert Bradley's Blackwater Surprise. And he was really popular in the 90s. Uh, blind blues singer with an all white backing band. They found him in Eastern Market, which is a sort of big open air market. That's part one. Uh, to me, his voice. The music really represents Detroit in a certain era for me, as does the Michigan Central Station. For those familiar with Ruin Porn, it is the great abandoned uh, train station as you get off the Ambassador Bridge. It's being reborn. Ford's 
Fords has purchased it and is doing something with their automated car lines. It really is a symbol for a lot of us local, locally here. So I mix those two. Uh, to, to, to be standing in Roosevelt Park, which is a big park that overlooks Michigan Central Station, and for the first time in my lifetime to see lights come on behind actual windows in a 20-plus story building, it was a very emotional moment. And it, it, it says something about the willingness of Detroit to survive despite and while its future may be problematic in terms of gentrification, there's hope if we look for one symbol. And this, for me, is one of my one symbols. So this is, through darkness, the light returns to Michigan Central Station after Robert Bradley's back, Blackwater surprise train. Rain falls and gutter rifts, echoing back through lopsided benches, uneven sidewalks, and trees left for wild I walk Roosevelt Park after the first cold rain of Alahana Kishuks. This rain, the same that for decades has provided a, a processionally slow return to the Carolinian forest that city planners and politicians fear more than the sequel to Pontiac and Bloody Run. Through the darkness of a park that knows of human footfalls and passing and in shared mythologies, I move to the crooked lights lining the curbsides. Above us all, the hulk of last century's train station, the ever-vigilant specter above Springwell's treaty land, rumors of four-story basement oceans, and poltergeists of graffiti artists, ruined porn hunters, and crackheads swirl on the decay, decay, decayed plaster dust you can smell from across the street. Standing here beneath its bulk, I gaze upon the backlit darkness of what a generation of corporation subdivision sprawl left us on this stolen land. Silent and falling rain pattern, there is, there is little left for crying my heart out. I wonder, I think I can hear that old whistle blowing. And it arrives in a crescendo of full orchestrated rock blues band and the triple flash then hold of a return 10 stories above a Werner Highway puddle. Deeper black, where abandoned station rises way up, windows burn to life. My time with you has come to an end, at least for today. Hope to see you soon, London. Uh, I can hear the birds sing, and that must mean it's time to go. But I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank David Barrick and Poetry London for putting this event together. I know that many poets, many writers uh, absolutely are just dying to have an audience again. We're dying to talk to you. We're dying to come out and meet you. It's what makes our writing. And events like Poetry London are so critical to all this. I want to thank them for the continued support of poets, not only in Sowesto, Ontario, but all of Canada. Uh, thank you, um, Anushik, Chi Miigwech, and uh, Kwek, uh, Kwek Lao. Uh, Kwek Lao is the wrong one. <laughs> Lepa Kanawich is the right word. We'll see you again soon, in person. Lots of hugs, and we'll share some time together soon. Thank you again. Hi, everyone. I'm Poetry London board member Madeline Bassnett, and I'm very happy to welcome Lucas Crawford to the Poetry London reading series. Lucas is a prolific poet and critic and works as an associate professor at the University of New Brunswick. He is the author of three books of poetry. The first, Sideshow Concessions, won the 2015 Robert Croach Award for Innovative Poetry. His second book, The Highline Scavenger Hunt, is a brilliant collection that extends Lucas's academic work on architecture, gender, and space to explore queer history and the redesign of Manhattan's Highline Park. Lucas's latest collection, Belated Briss of the Brain Sick, is the winner of the recent 2020 J.M. Abraham Poetry Award. The award judges describe this collection as, quote, dazzling with tightly crafted formal poems, list poems, prose poems, an erotic short story, and multilingual puns. As the judges further observe, the collection explores themes of, quote, appetite, wellness, queerness, the ways the system fails the mentally ill, pushing boundaries of gender and other so-called binaries, 
delighting in the sacred architectures of the body, Crawford's Briss describes a transformation brimming with love, feast, prayer, and ceremony. Indeed, it does. Belated Briss delights in wordplay and rhymes that revel in the sound and feeling of language, the, quote, queer linguistic bric-a-brac, the crochet tchotchkes of my cantankerous tongue. The collection reclaims a Jewish identity lost in the tangles of familial histories and evokes a visceral physicality and sensuality. Worlds collide in these poems, as they do in the poem Grocery Shopping, where the speaker meets in the produce aisles of a grocery store, quote, the intake nurse who supervised my midnight disrobement in the acute section of the psych ward. It's an uncomfortable collision. We realize this right away, but Lucas doesn't let us back away. Instead, he pushes us closer towards that discomfort as his speaker directly addresses the nurse. Did you feel you were stripping an orange of pith, he asks, and emphasizes the power and balance further with a repetition of, you watched me disrobe, you watched my surprise, you watched my pierced nipples, you said I couldn't keep my tampons. But the directness of the speaker's voice now and also becomes a challenge. The described vulnerability of the speaker is powerful, demanding recognition. As the speaker observes, now we are choosing fruit. We both have all our duds on. I'm spending time with this poem because I think it demonstrates what, for me, is most striking about this collection. The way it evokes survival and transcendence through humor and honesty and a fierceness that makes us both watch and listen. I'm really looking forward to both watching and listening to Lucas Crawford tonight. Welcome, Lucas, to Poetry London. Hi, Poetry London! And anyone watching this from anywhere outside of London, Ontario, um, I'm Lucas Crawford. I'm a poet. Thank you so much for having me. I really wish that we could be together right now. I wish we could uh, do a reading and you do an open mic and then we go to Jewel of India at Richmond uh, around Dundas and I eat all the butter chicken and then sleep for 14 hours. Um, that's about my idea of a perfect night. But here we are. I live in Fredericton, New Brunswick, but I am coming to you from Edmonton, Alberta, and I am standing uh, on my own two feet to try to bring uh, the, the vibe of a real reading to you today. Also, my hip is sore, and it's time for me to be standing like an adult. Why did I tell you that? Well, it happened, so I'm just gonna keep going. This is my little book, um, Belated Briss of the Brain Sick, that came out in October 2019. Oh, it feels like a long time ago, a different world ago, yeah? Um, with Nightwood Editions. I'm gonna read a, um, a few poems from uh, this one here, and I'm gonna read a couple pandemic poems, uh, if only because you're probably watching this from your... Um, your couch and your pajamas where you're eating uh, cookie dough, if you have fine taste like me. And so uh, why not a couple pandemic poems? When the pandemic discourse really shifted, I was um, lucky enough to be at the BAM Center um, for a literary thang and ended up isolating and getting a COVID test, yada, 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 uh, but was in my little room at the Banff Center, and they're nice, but they're small, and no food autonomy for a fat foodie is difficult. Um, anyway, I wrote a few poems while in this mental state of like, here I am quarantining, who knows what's happening with the world, and I'm here at this like center of, you know, art and creativity, but by myself. So I'll, I'll start with that. And because I don't have a printer in the pandemic, I need to like go over here and I'm gonna even probably have to uh, scroll a little bit as we go. Okay. Oh, such a relief not to see myself as I read this poem for you. 
a friend at the BAMF Center, as the pandemic hit, was like, can you imagine what our horoscopes must have said for this month? Like, who, how could this have been predicted? And so I wrote a retrospective horoscope for, I guess, March 2020, and it's bizarre to think it's uh, July, or almost July. In any case, retrospective horoscope, March 2020. Gemini, you can resume eating for two. Your room is not your womb, but weeks trip into trimesters. You will not labor into the hall for seven plus days. Just enough time to create a new world. Or, as encanted by the magazine next to the one you like, lose seven pounds! You may do one of these. Gemini, everyone's gone home. You no longer have to worry about your neighbors being sick of hearing you sing along to Carly Rae Bedlam. But who will you imagine is watching you shower, hearing you sing lisped, smelling what you spritz on those limp wrists? Your ruling planet is Uranus! Oh, predictable. Around the 20th, you'll run low on prunes, but room service roughage will have to do. Lay off the Joni Mitchell, unless you want to feel blue, you too. Not stoned, butch. You did a lot of therapy to learn the lesson that you ought to fuck a virus into the lifeblood of your death. Will you fail? Finally take a D? A measuring tape would tell you to strap on your boots, twinkle feet. For the 15 by 20 laps your room permits. Take a hike or not. Your sororal self dated a theretofore straight pro-life twin, Gemini. The other twin came queer a few years later, their other sister too. Brother remains holdout. But you think everyone is. Mm, no, everyone can. Remember, this is a faith mode. A gift for seeing potential. Lucky numbers. 44, 36, 413. Must we trace a tendency to a primal scene? Monday, you may think so. On Tuesday, Freud, you are not. But God love a prohibition. Don't. Don't. Don't tell mom the babysitter's hot. You are still full of that house. This month mightn't go swimmingly. There are not so many Pisces in today's sadder sea. Hooked. Or is it tied up? Let the mountains air dry you free. So that's a uh, Banff Center quarantine pandemic retrospective horoscope. While I'm on my other uh, document here, I'll keep going and do the, the second Banff poem for you. And I wrote this as I waited to get a COVID test. And this is back when like you had to be on hold for eight hours and then get an appointment. And then there's a lot of waiting and wondering. And so this is sort of me imagining the, the COVID test as a possible last intimate encounter um, with another person and my body. And at this point, I still thought I, for some reason, but it was early, I thought it was a under the tongue swab, like a, a where you put the Ativan swab, not an up the nose. And I've, I've kept that error. Why not? Please don't swab me gently. Tug sublingually at the wet quick of still sentient me. Pent up? I'd rather held down. I'd rather Edmonton Downtown, 2007, dust dry air in Churchill Square on a nervous night walk from 97th Ave. I'd rather have Allie hit my buzzer, buzzer, 
I don't even know her, to bring me purple flowers. Today, slurping Beaujolais from her roadways would be reckless. Breathless, I await hazmat razzmatazz, and all that my crass bratty boy self can dream up in 700 hours. Day one disturbs nostalgically. The time I stayed late alone in grade seven, and the teacher let go a dramatic sigh, to which my freest eye replied, I want you to moan like that for me. Silently, yes, but life is the din of this moment's reverb. Don't swab me gently. Rinse my mouth. Don't use soap. If it's the last finger I'll taste, you'll dirty it first, I hope. Test me! I love a high grade, been feverish to achieve. Swab me raw, swab rough, swab slow. Pin me down with blue ribbons before you go, so I have something to show for all this. There's a bowling trophy with a young girl's name on it, back home. There's a trove of desperate letters from a 90s crush in a drawer. I reminded her of a lesser known Madonna hit. Sweat comes down like rain when you weigh yourself against the odds and keep running westward. God bamf! You would try to be my last home, dissembler of habit, firm hand that always pulls cotton batting off of me. You would be my last crush, but there are so many of you, and so many of me. And if this one, I, sustained a tendency, it was only to make myself available to be identified with or against, which remains, I do hope, generosity. Okay, um, I think I'll, I'll pause it there and then come back to you with another video, a few poems from this guy. Hello again, Poetry London, still Lucas Crawford, still belated verse of the brain sick. I'm going to read you two of, um, I guess maybe my favorite poems from this book. They're both kind of uh, long ones. This book as a whole, it's kind of a queer mental health, love, family, trauma journey that has to do partly with kind of um, uncovering a... a previously hidden um, Jewish, abusive, complex uh, ancestry of, of my dad. His, I always thought that my grandfather was just kind of, um, I had never met him, but I thought he was, from what I had heard, you know, um, just a racist, abusive alcoholic. But my actual, um, not actual, my, my, you know, biologically, whatever, uh, grandfather was a Jewish taxi driver in, in Halifax. And so uh, this is about him, but it's also about taxi cabs, which have had a big role in my life. I know that sounds silly, but it's true. My life in taxi cabs. <laughs> Fixing the hair, sorry. Be an adult. My life in taxicabs. A cabbie can be a physician, a prof, a gentleman, a jerk. A cabbie can be a magician and reduce your leg work. In Fredericton, 1949, a cabbie was manslaughtered. Another dead cabbie is your secret Jewish grandfather. Taking cabs is my fulfillment of a class mobility narrative encrypted in the dead cells of my parched arches, buried in the marrow of my heavy metatarsals. 
For catharsis, I wash the tired trotters of my cochon carcass. Too many marching band marches with my largesse. How many Jews does it take to screw in the brightest electric menorah to ever fluoresce? A cabbie poses with his son, your father, by Halifax Harbor. A cabbie poses proudly with his son in front of his taxi. But then when my dad's mother remarried, she reclaimed my dad, told him he was no longer Jewish and would never see his father again. When the new stepfather met his new stepson, he put down the bottle and said, you're fat. Let's see if this stone will break over your head. The allure of a cab is that someone will come when you call and the mirage of a home to which you can and want to return. A cab can take you anywhere. To the dispensary at West Forth and Burrard, if you want to roll one up with an onion leaf page torn from your unabridged work of the bard. The professor said it would be a good investment. Louis Althusser sees me on Barrington, trying to hail a cab to no avail. He doesn't turn around when I scream, hey you, but I warned his wife he's already set sail. I plied him with old triangles of burning bourbon, but he said that his fate and my rhymes were altogether overdetermined. Althusser rejected the psych ward, then killed his wife, Helen, later that year. So take him with a grain of sand in your shoe. Did it ever occur to you that the wandering Jew just couldn't get a cab? His corkscrew curls will sweeten the breeze till Easter. He limps without rhythm. All he wants is a running meter. What was the food that fueled the farts with which this cab was hot boxed? One hundred years ago, Halifax exploded, and the profile of a dead man still shadows a window of St. Paul's Church on Argyle. A while ago, it was on Jeopardy. What is a ready-made sculpture of sham memory? What is a salt and pepper portrait of a belated Zadie and me? What do you call a fag without a cab? A hailing Mary? Is that a gaff that takes us aback? Are we afraid? of my queer linguistic bric-a-brac, the crotchety tchotchkes of my cantankerous tongue wrung sky dry. In Montreal, a glut of taxis meant my butt got cruised. They could sniff out a fat ass in need on St. Denis, slow down until my averted eyes signaled decline. They could sense my tired behind, bruised cheek on St. Zotique. They would sneak over to the road's cold shoulder and have me in the back seat in a busted heart's meek beat when my smile belied a sick belly of slick smoked meat gone awry. Sub cabs stunk. Goat fromage aged in small hay nest. Yet I, sick wandering Jew, was often desperate for a meter. Flustered by mustard and cussing rich custard, I'd hop in and bastardize my address. Du sang burp laurier est. Once on Avenue de Dr. Penfield, a cabbie exclaimed, Woman drivers! Am I right? Men and women couldn't be further apart. Oh, we're closer than we seem, I said. We are always closer than we seem. The call is coming from inside the house. Wouldn't it have been just fab if I'd licked his earlobe and said, there's a clitoris sick throbbing inside of this cab. His wrists, my tie, my mouth, his ass caught. Who's to say if I did or if I did not? In other cabs, gratuitous diet advice, 
Less cheese. Cheese makes you too thick. More cabbage. You're so fat I can't even see your dick. I smell burnt bagels and flotsam floods my brain, vexed when a cabbie calls us sisters one day and brothers the next. I need a new necrophiliac GPS. I play chess with Checker, but they can't get me to dead grandfather or to work on time. A cabbie can be a physician, a prof, a gentleman, a jerk, a mirage, a montage, a loan, or a legion. Our very last cab had a breakdown on Regent. We bought an old car this week. I'll miss the conversations, except those in which pro-life politics and chauvinism feature. I've always been more afraid of a blue lagoon than of a creature. And I'll actually, I'm switching it up. I will end with a short one called Lines for a Night at the Bathhouse. And what's the London connection? I should have looked up where all the hot bathhouses are in London. I'm sure there is one. Um, wouldn't have been my interest when I lived there in 2005, 2006. Things always change. It's uh, a positive, I think. And I guess if you don't know what a bathhouse is, you can Google it and give yourself a few hours because maybe you'll be interested. I don't know. Lines for a night at the bathhouse. Coke can be ingested with a bankrupt laundry cart and spooled fiber. I saw it. I wept about him when my host's blue budgie bird sprung loose, then returned. I saw it on the mantle. Photo of a virgin saint aspirates and cries. A faucet. What news? Where is my bruise that curls like holy hair? Probably the last place I saw it. Headless Saint Christopher drives a hot magenta camper now. Go-go's on speakers. Chalice is empty, his tab pass due alone. And his god is due for an audit. I try to get through with ambiguity while my breasts, sick, strive to reach the slick Floor. I have no dick per se, but people aren't observant. He'd tell you that he saw it. Condemned St. Henri co-ops can hold dozens of freaks, seeking freaks, seeking the unknown so as to own their own bones. He didn't know he'd missed it till he saw it. Why can yeast belch itself lighter? How far do our eruptions reach? Could I draw it? Can gas be mapped? Do secrets smell? Did the water lily cringe when Monet saw it? There's no reason to push anyone anywhere by the back of the neck. Withdrawn, coat your tone in clover honey and just ask. Why pick a bone when you can gnaw it? The partridge in the pear tree is lonely. The goose has no idea what's coming. A heart bobs in a bowl of cold water in the sink as we still try to thaw it. When I believe my eyes, this mirage tastes like mint. I will squint till I see fit. We covet touch in bubbles and dehydrate it. Fruit, are you sure you saw all this? Thank you, Poetry London. It's an honor. Hope to see you soon in London or elsewhere. Everyone out there fighting white supremacy and surviving a pandemic. Good luck and take care. Thanks for tuning in.
Thank you to Dave Montour, D.A. Lockhart, and Lucas Crawford for their fantastic readings, as well as to all of you in our audience. Please join us again on September 23rd at 7 p.m. for the first reading of the 2020-2021 season, which will feature poets Greg Santos and 2020 Trillium Poetry Award winner Roxana Bennett. Stay tuned for an announcement of our new season's full lineup on Twitter, Facebook, and our website.